me turn my mic. Are we live? All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. To all those who are joining online, welcome. It's great to have you with us. And praise the Lord for our technology that you can uh, join and listen to this service. If you're wondering why I'm wearing a suit, it's because today we're going to be observing a memorial service to honor the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus in laying down his life on the cross for us. We know that Sunday morning is coming and our Lord will rise victorious from the grave, but we're not there yet. Today, we set aside this time to worship Jesus Christ as we remember all that he was willing to endure for us that we might be a forgiven people through his broken body and through his shed blood. So let me just share how the service is going to go today. After a time of meditation through prayer, through song and the word, considering our Lord's death upon the cross, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. So if you're able, please have your juice and your bread ready so that at that time you can participate with us wherever you're at. So if you guys would bow your heads, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer as we open up the service this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity we have this afternoon to set aside this time together and to think about all that your son Jesus Christ took upon himself and endured that he might rescue us from the penalty of our sin. Because of his sacrifice on the cross, we never have to face you as judge, but we can boldly approach your throne of grace. Lord, we come to you free and forgiven, washed in the precious blood of Jesus. And Lord, now we ask by the revelation of your Holy Spirit, Lord, as Paul wrote to the Ephesians, may you help us comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and height of the love of Christ, which passes all knowledge. Lord, today help us to express and pour out our love and gratitude to Jesus for all he's done. We love you and we just want to worship you today together. Pray that you would be magnified above all things, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. afternoon oasis of hope turn to uh, Isaiah chapter 53 what a beautiful passage that really describes what this day is all about and what happened on this day back over 2,000 years ago so we're going to read Isaiah chapter 53 verses 1 through 8 so as we would do if you were here with me why don't you stand to honor God as we read his word. Let me, let me read this passage for us. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 8. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. 
He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. Thank you. 
for our transgressions, he was crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds, by his wounds we are healed. He was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our sins. This week, in my devotional reading, I came across a statement that Jesus made that got me thinking about what he was going to endure on the cross for us. It's found in Luke 12, 50. As Jesus was teaching and giving different parables about the kingdom of heaven and discipleship, he makes this statement. In Luke 12 50 he said I have a baptism to be baptized with and how distressed I am till it is accomplished what a statement to think about this morning on as we consider Good Friday the day that the Lord gave his life for us on the cross he said I have a baptism to be baptized with and how distressed I am Till it's accomplished. We got to remember for a moment who it, who it is who's saying that he's so distressed until it is finished. This is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came down from heaven. And as you read through the Gospels, consider the one who, with a word, could calm the storm. So he's master over the earthly realms. You know over the physical universe he was the one with the word he could cast out a legion of demons out of a man and displayed total control over the supernatural realm over the demonic realm he's he's the one who with the word he could say little girl I say to you arise he said I am the resurrection and I am the life Whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet he will live again. And so think about Jesus, everything that he did, all the miracles, the power that he displayed, um, the supernatural wisdom that he could know what people were thinking. 
And when, so when we hear Jesus say, I, I have a baptism to go through and I'm distressed until it's accomplished. Jesus, as, as uh, Rick read in Isaiah, he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He said, the son of man, you know, has nowhere to lay his head. Foxes have holes, birds of the air, they have nests, but the son of man, he has nowhere to lay his head. Yet did Jesus ever complain about his humble situation? He knew hunger, he knew thirst, you know, he knew to be in want, to get up early, to stay up late, doing the ministry of the Lord all day long. So when you, if you were to ask, what would make the Lord Jesus feel distressed or, or think about that? It's got to be something very significant. And so that's what we want to, I want to focus in on before we get to the and then we're going to read through the crucifixion account together but several times in the gospels it's not just here jesus refers to the cross as a baptism when the mother of james and john came and asked that her two sons be granted to sit one on the right hand and one on the left hand in the kingdom jesus answered and he said you don't know what you're asking are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? So we ask the question, because Jesus, he's comparing the cross to baptism. So in what way might we compare the cross to a baptism? You know, there's only one way to accomplish a baptism. One has to pass through it. To be water baptized, you can't go around it. You can't step over or pass over it. You can't merely stand beside it and just look at the waters. Splash your hand in there and say, I'm baptized. It doesn't work like that, right? No, but one must willingly enter in and lay down and surrender beneath the surface of the water. Becoming completely enveloped in what you're baptized in. There's no other way. If you would be baptized, you must enter the waters of baptism. So what kind of baptism was the cross for Jesus? What would he have to willingly enter into and lay down and surrender beneath if he was going to accomplish that baptism? We know from reading the gospel accounts, it was a baptism of suffering and of agony it was a baptism of humiliation and shame of isolation and separation from the father as God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him a separation occurred in the Godhead that had never happened before and it'll never happen ever again in the history of the Godhead as Jesus experienced that deep loneliness on the cross his heart was broken and he cried out from the cross one of these you know he made seven statements one of them he made was this my God my God why have you forsaken me there was something terrible that happened as Jesus hung upon the cross that would never be experienced again a separation in the perfect fellowship as God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him in John 12 Jesus speaking of his coming baptism said of the cross the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Let's look at one final scene before Christ's baptism of the cross. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
on the night that he was arrested and betrayed by Judas the night before he goes to the cross. As you read through the gospel accounts, it says that Jesus began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. There's that word again. Remember he said, how distressed I am until it's finished. He began to become deeply distressed and sorrowful again. So he takes Peter, James, and John, his inner circle, and they go a little bit further into the garden. And he says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. So he, he begs his friends, come and keep watch and pray with me. And then he went a little further and he fell on his face and prayed saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And then if you read in the Gospel of Luke, it says that an angel appeared to him from heaven and strengthened Jesus. If this doesn't give you a sense of what he was about to face, of what he knew in his soul he was about to face, of what heaven understood he was about to endure, this gives us another glimpse into it. The Lord actually, God the Father sends an angel to come and strengthen Jesus to fulfill his mission. And as he prayed, Dr. Luke tells us his sweat became as great drops of blood falling to the ground. He's under such severe pressure during this time that he experiences a super rare medical condition that can be experienced under tremendous stress. The capillaries break and blood emerges and begins to mingle with his sweat as, he, as he's praying. Great drops of blood falling to the ground. And he prays that prayer of, Lord, if there's any other way that this cup could pass from me, you know, let it be. He prays it two more times, a total of three times. But he says, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Father, if there be any other way that men and women could be saved, you know, show it to me now. But Lord, I'm willing to endure this baptism. I'm willing to pass through this baptism of the cross to come under everything that Jew, that Gentile, and even the demonic realm is about to pour out on me. I'm willing, God, if that's your will. You know, it's interesting. Earlier, as I read in John 12, Jesus says, I'm deeply troubled. The hour is approaching. Um, and what am I going to say now? Father, save me from this hour. It's for this reason I came. But what did Jesus pray, interestingly enough, in the garden? Lord, if there be any other way. He was 100% God and he was 100% human. Both natures totally uh, at the same time in his humanity. You know, earlier it is, it, you know, he's sitting there saying, this is why I've come. Am I going to say, God, help me get out of this now? That's the whole reason I came. But when it came down to the very hour, in his humanity, and it wasn't sin, because we know Jesus was sinless. And it's not to detract from him at all. But it, it just shows us a glimpse. This was a real man who was about to face this, although he was the son of God as well. All wrapped up in a mystery in one, right? In his incarnation. And just in his simplicity, he prayed, God, if there be any other way, but nevertheless... Not as I will, as you will. He said, I have a baptism to be baptized with. And how distressed I am until it's accomplished. So now we're going to, if you will turn in your Bibles to Matthew 27. We're going to start in verse 11. And we're going to read about this baptism that he went under. So that he could pay our ransom. Matthew 27, <clears throat> starting in verse 11. And I want you to just follow with me. We're going to go through verse 54. 
It's a long passage of scripture, but we're, we're going to read it in respect of the Lord Jesus to see what he had to endure for us so that we could sit to, today as a saved people. Starting in verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. And then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him not one word, so that the governor marveled greatly. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. And therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they all said to him, Let him be crucified. Then the governor said, why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified! When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and he washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, his blood be on us and our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around them. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. But when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. Now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put over his head the accusation written against him, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then the two robbers were crucified with him one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. <clears throat> Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross 
and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. <clears throat> and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Jesus said, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am. Until it is finished, it is accomplished. But just like I was saying, that image of what if you want to be baptized, you have to be a willing participant. You enter the water on your own volition. You lay down surrender and you go underneath and take upon you the full effect of what's going to happen. And so Jesus was willing. He was willing to endure the cross, scorning the shame for the joy that was set before him of earning our salvation. And, you know, they, they did say one, one true statement there when they were mocking and blaspheming him on the cross. He saved others, himself he cannot save. Why? Because if he had saved himself, we could have never been saved. There was only one plan of salvation. And if Jesus was not willing to carry it out, none of us would have been saved. In their mockery, they actually said a truth. He saved others and himself he could not save to, to accomplish that. You'll notice this. You know, we hold the service, the Good Friday service at noon for an hour in the passage, it said from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. The sixth hour was noon because the Jews started the reckoning of the day from 6 a.m. So the sixth hour was noon. From noon to 3 o'clock, there was darkness over the land. That was the Father's thoughts. That was what he wanted them to feel about how evil and wicked their participation in killing the Son of God had been both Jew and Gentile, and putting the perfect sinless Lamb of God to death. Even, even Pilate, all his, you know, Pilate said, I find nothing, uh, you know, no sin in this man. And he didn't want nothing to do with it. Under pressure, he succumbed to the pressure and gave the order after he had had him scourged to be crucified. But he said, I find, you know, I don't want anything to do with the blood of this just and innocent man. What the Lord was willing to endure that we might be saved. In Isaiah it said that his visage or his countenance, his, his face was marred more you know, than any man in his body, more than the sons of men. The beatings that he took in the, in the mock trials both the Jews, they, they placed a hood over his head and they struck him and said, prophesy Christ, 
you know, who struck you as he's sitting there unable to defend himself. That was part of his baptism that he was willing to take. To be spat upon, to have the phlegm of sinful, wicked man, you know, all over him. The humiliation, he was willing to go through that baptism. To have his beard plucked out, to have a crown of thorns, not gently, but thrust down upon his head. And then a mock reed, like the king's scepter, to strike it and drive those thorns in his brow, which we sung about. The thorns on your brow, they tell me how you bore so much shame to love me. You know, he did that for us. He was willing to endure. That was part of the baptism that he was distressed. But, but beyond all the physical, you know, and then even the humiliation and the shame to be hung and displayed like that, to die a capital, you know, punishment like that, like a criminal, like a murderer, like an insurrectionist, beyond all of that, That speaks nothing even of all, you know, the supernatural realm, the spiritual realm of what we only get hinted at when Jesus, when he cried out from the cross, he didn't cry out about being beaten or that he was innocent or this was unfair, nothing. The thing that broke his heart was that he experienced that separation as somehow the Lord, you know, God turned his face and hid his face from Jesus for that period of time when he bore, when God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us. That was that moment where there's a separation in the Godhead that we can't really understand because we come to the Lord, we were already separated. We were born in sins and transgressions. We never knew what it was like apart from that. Jesus had never experienced that from all of eternity. And yet he comes into, you know, time and space in a human form just like ours and humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. And in that moment, he experienced that great anguish and pain that broke his heart to experience what it felt like to be separated from God for that moment of time for those few hours as he was upon the cross. And it's interesting, Jesus said, I've said it several times, but he was so, dis you know, he was distressed until it's accomplished, until it's finished. What was the last thing he said before he yielded up his spirit to the Lord? He says, it is finished, paid in full. The ransom, the debt that was owed to God for our sin, Jesus paid the total full satisfying price with his holy precious body and his blood by shedding his blood he paid the complete price so that we could be set free we could be have access to the lord so with that if if the men would come forward and we're going to and if you guys at home if you have your juice and have your bread um rick's going to come and speak about about the the bread and the body, and then we're going to partake. As we uh, prepare to take the bread this afternoon, I want us to think about everything that it represents. Obviously, the bread represents Jesus' body, which was given for us, and Jesse just read that passage of what happened. We know his skin and his flesh were torn and broken by blows with rods and fists, by whippings and scourgings. He was kicked, he was spit upon. They put thorns on his head, nails in his hands and feet, and a spear in his side. And he went through all of those things for us. Isaiah 53, 5 that I read earlier, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds. We are healed. The bread represents that. 
But also Jesus said he's the bread of life. The bread represents Jesus' whole life. As we take the bread, we need to remember that everything that Jesus means to us, every bit of who he is, creator, brother, friend, confidant, and the one who's going to return for us and take us to heaven. Listen to his very own words from John 6.35. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And this bread represents not only Jesus' mangled body, but it represents healing for our sins. Scripture tells us that Jesus did not have one broken bone after all that he went through. Why is that important? Because just as the Old Testament had people pick out the perfect lamb without defect, Jesus was the perfect sacrifice for our sins without defect. The bread reminds us of that, that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, that he was the perfect God-man, as Jesse mentioned earlier. All God and all man, the only man to ever lead a completely sinless life here on earth, that made him the perfect sacrifice. And finally, as we take this bread, we need to remember now that we are the body of Christ. It all comes forward. Not only does the bread remind us of the body of Jesus, which is past and gone, but it reminds us of the present. We are now the body of Christ, and we need to take the gospel forward. So as we take the bread this afternoon, let us remember all of these things. guys would uh, lift up the bread which is a symbol of the Lord's broken body broken for our sins you notice that these crackers are pierced he was pierced for our transgressions right and by his wounds we are healed it's interesting in the the final week of of Jesus's life when he was in Jerusalem and at the temple they sent the Herodians to question him they sent the Sadducees, they sent the Pharisees, and they all, they questioned him and questioned him, you know, and no one could answer and withstand his wisdom. He perfectly answered all their questions, and it said after that, nobody dared to ask him any more questions from that time forward. Do you know that that was their, their time of inspection? They were inspecting the perfect Lamb of God, looking for some flaw to try to disqualify him. Because the sacrifice, as we know from the Old Testament law, had to be without blemish. It had to be perfect. And Jesus was the perfect, spotless Lamb of God, examined by all. Even his enemies could find no sin or fault within him. And it was that perfect Lamb of God who offered up his body to be broken on the cross. So if you lift the bread and we'll, we'll pray. Lord, thank you so much as we reflect on what you are willing to go through Lord, to pay for our sins, to have your body broken for us. And Lord, we know that resurrection is coming and your body was made whole. But as we sang in the song, what's interesting, forever your scars remain. You know, forever they tell us how much you love us. When you resurrected, you still had the marks of your crucifixion, Lord, that you earned on the cross when you went through and endured all that for us. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Lord, for loving us and being willing to do that, to become our Savior. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. saints the cup signifies the blood of Jesus so today we remember the tremendous price that our Lord Jesus paid for us but not just for us for the entire world <coughs> you know the, the Bible says in Romans 
chapter 5, verse 9, that we have been justified and saved from God's grace by the blood of Jesus. There is power in the blood of Jesus. <coughs> Ephesians 1, 7, we have been redeemed and forgiven by the blood of Jesus. And 1 John 1, 7, we are cleansed of all our sins by the blood of Jesus. So how can this be? How can we be cleansed? 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. You know, glory to God that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. But not just that. To cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So how does he see us now? As righteous. So thank the Lord Jesus for, for his sacrifice. And I'm reminded of the hymn. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Pastor Jesse. It's been said before and it's been well said that nothing more precious has ever touched the earth than the blood of our Savior as he hung upon the cross. Amen. There was nothing could compare without value of Jesus being willing to pour out and shed his blood for us. We just stand in awe of his sacrifice and the fact that God made it so simple that through humility and belief, trust in him and his sacrifice, we could be saved and washed of every sin. He said, you know, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, though they're like crimson, they could be white as snow, white as wool. Wow. That the Lord would have such amazing grace the cross is the greatest demonstration of love the world has ever seen. The greatest demonstration of God's love. But God demonstrated his own love toward us in this, in that while we were sinners, still sinners, Jesus died for us. The innocent for the guilty. Do you know that we were all like Barabbas? The guilty was set free while the innocent was condemned. Barabbas is a picture of us. Jesus took the penalty that Barabbas deserved and we deserved upon himself, and yet he went free. And by faith and belief in the Son of God, we can be free from that eternal judgment from that our sins deserve. And it's all made possible by the blood of Jesus, the baptism that he was willing to be baptized with through the cross. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we're just so happy and thankful and grateful this morning, Lord, to be lifting the symbol of your shed blood and offering it up, you know, in your name, praying. Thank you, Lord, that we are forgiven and we're free because of you, Lord Jesus. Lord, you were, walked on this earth and Lord, you were willing to identify with us to become our you know, companion, become our master, our teacher, and show us how to find God. And you went to the cross and you made a way, a living way, Lord, so that now we can approach the throne we couldn't approach God before we were covered in sin, but as Rick said, now, you know, we are considered righteous in your sight because of your blood. So, Lord, we, we receive it thankfully. We ask, would you help us, Lord, to, as is always our desires, to live for you day by day, carry out your mission. You died for us. Help us to live for you. Thank you for your blood. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll partake together.
And if uh, you guys will close us in our worship song. We're going to close with nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's hymn 135. Okay. service on and Lord our greatest prayer and desire this afternoon was that your sacrifice Lord would be remembered and would be honored and magnified and Lord Jesus that you would be lifted up for all that you did Lord and we're so looking forward to resurrection Sunday Lord uh, as prophesied you would be laid in the tomb but you wouldn't stay there for long Lord, we know you're going to rise on Sunday morning early, Lord, and the angel's going to roll back that stone, not to let you out, but to show that you had already resurrected and you were gone, Lord, as, um, Lord, as evidence and proof, the final evidence and great evidence that you truly were the Son of God and that it was impossible for death to hold you. Lord, thank you for your blood. And as the, as the hymn says, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
you know, it's not of any right good that I've done. It's only by your blood. So we worship you. We praise you. We magnify you. Help us to live, to honor your great sacrifice. Lord, help us to be your pleasing sons and, and daughters that you've brought into your family. And Lord, we just say we love you. In Jesus' name we pray.